Welcome back to Mooney Mayhem. I'm Osric Vox, and the star breakdowns continue with Ransom Graham and Lake House Fever. Of course, spoiler warning if you have not seen these episodes, go watch them, then come back here. You guys ready? Let's dive in, starting with Ransom Graham. Right out the gate, we still have yet another dosage of Meteora still has her memories. With Marco remarking that Meteora is leaving headless dolls in his bed, the one he brings in particular wearing red and sporting a mole. Obviously, Meteora has no reason to do this unless she still doesn't like Marco because she has her memories of the Chordina Chronicles. I mentioned it in my last breakdown and did an entire theory on this, but I believe this will unfold with Meteora rapidly aging and revealing, oh no, I still remember everything. Moving on, Star uses Sparkle Glitter Bomb Expand to restore her and Marco's respective rooms, this time attached to the Monster Temple. It seems as the Star grew impatient of Eclipse's renovations for their new room, though it makes me wonder why she didn't just do this in the first place, unless it was out of respect for Eclipsa, which is understandable. Yet, Marco is quickly drawn to the Never Zone within Dimension X-103, Hecapoo's dimension where Marco returns to his adult body. In the Never Zone, Marco quickly squats watches the fairy and reveals they're great for summoning charms. His comparison between fairies and mosquitoes is a nod to the movie Labyrinth, where Hoggle goes around spraying fairies, one of which bites an unsuspecting Sarah. We're introduced to a brand new character, who apparently Marco quested with in his time in Dimension X-103, Brunzetta, who fans have drawn parallels to Thor due to her viking appearance and association with lightning. Her axe could be compared to the likes of Stormbreaker, though that really is better a Bill's weapon, Thor just dons a similar weapon Ultimate Mjolnir, which is named Stormbreaker in Avengers Infinity War. Brunzetta's presence easily draws out the revelation that Star Butterfly is bisexual. The rainbows in her eyes upon getting near to Brunzetta is similar to the colors of the bisexual flag. It's a neat detail and lines up with what one of the show's directors, Sabrina Catugno, declared back in 2017. Everyone in Star is bisexual. Whether or not you want to take that to heart is up to you, but I don't think any of Star's interactions in this segment paint her as heterosexual. We also learned that Marco got turned into a yam for an entire year after insulting the cooking of a necromancer, getting the nickname Yammy by Brunzetta. After a brief action sequence and rescuing Nachos, oh baby girl, Marco realizes he did indeed steal Old Chapo, and as a consequence, a demon has wreaked havoc in the Never Zone, melting away the Ice Kingdom. This fiery pig demon may be based off of the Chinese Zodiac, as a pig is one of the animals, with fire as one of the elements that can be assigned depending on when the recipient is born. After returning El Chapo, goodbye, dear friend, you served us well for like two episodes, Marco decides to remain in the Never Zone to help restore the kingdom. And although he wasn't gone for more than a few seconds in Mini's dimension, the age gap between him and Star is larger than before. I'm just saying. I also find it, uh, weird that the writers decided to go through with Star calling Marco hot in this moment, considering all the romantic tension as of recent in the show, and the fact she has a boyfriend. On that note, let's move over to Lake House Fever. The title is a reference to both cabin fever, the term that means irritability and similar symptoms resulting from long confinement or isolation indoors, correlating to the predicament Star and Tom find themselves in, and it's a nod to the 2002 film of the same name, which stars Ryder Strong, Tom's voice actor. We get to meet more of Tom's family, as Star is spending the day with everyone. In addition to Tom's parents, we meet his aunt, Exparella, her boyfriend Luminous, and Tom's great-grandfather, Relicor, who seems to have some blood on his hands, being referred to as a lady killer, seemingly quite literal. As Star prepares to head for the DS's for a family dinner, an unforeseen storm suddenly hits, yet it only starts once Star begins to talk to Tom in a rather condescending way that blows him and his family off without any prior warning, queuing us in for the revelation that Tom's mother, Brath Melior, was orchestrating the storm. The Lucidor family indulges in the game of Drabble, a clear parody of the board game Scrabble, and after a rather awkward and intense moment of uh, bonding between Star and Brath Melior, we get a look at Tom's photo album. Although we learned this in the Book of Spells, where we first see these photos as well, the most interesting interesting takeaway for me is the revelation that Star's horns were actually given to her by Tom. This kind of clues us in that Star has always had a soft spot for Tom, when things weren't peachy between them. She still cared about him, even if she wasn't big on his anger management issues. You could also interpret this as Star owning the horn, 
Lanterns to have greater meaning beyond Tom, similar to how Kelly wanted to own Lava Lake Beach, and the Soul Rise beyond her relationship with Tad. We also learned that Tom's iconic carriage was built by himself. He put as much effort as possible to show Star he cares, and that he wanted to improve as a person, something he ultimately ended up doing. And now, there's a lot to unpack about the climax of this episode, but the revelation of Tom relaying to Star he knew about the kiss between her and Marco, and the circumstances that surrounded the event, comparing his reaction to Star's reaction, they're like night and day. It goes to show how far Tom has come dealing with his issues, while Star actually hasn't regressed very far at all in that regard. Ultimately, I think Star and Tom breaking up this episode wouldn't have been the best call because of how we see Star react and handle stressful situations. It isn't the right time yet. You could argue the end of season 3 with Star accepting that, hey, I need to accept my responsibilities, but that was in relation to her accepting her responsibilities as queen, not in relationships. We saw how she reacted to Song Day, to telling Marco her feelings about him right before she left for Muni, and then practically giving Marco the cold shoulder when he returned to Muni until she granted him the title of Squire. And now this, she wasn't even planning to tell Tom that she kissed Marco. If she's going to put all of that off, she's going to put off a breakup, hoping that things just kind of work out and that she doesn't have to address her feelings about Tom and Marco. To me, none of this was out of character and it didn't ruin the show, especially as we're only three episodes into a 21 episode season, but it goes to show that Star is not emotionally mature, and that really, Starco may not happen because she may just need to end up with herself. Wait, what's that? Wait, who's outside her door? What? What? How many pitchforks? Oh god, I mean, um, Starco for life! Starco! 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 Alright, but on a serious note, I know a lot of people weren't happy with this episode. People who supported Tom and Star. People who support Star and Marco. People who support Tom and Marco? Well, actually, I think Tom's comment about kissing Marco actually may have thrown them all alone there. But guys, understand. If you were cringing, you were supposed to be cringing. You're supposed to see that Star is not a good girlfriend. Again, I'll talk all about this more in another video because Lake House Fever deserves its own video. But what do you guys think? Out of these two episodes, which one did you like the most? You guys can save your thoughts on Lake House Fever, but if you feel as if you just need to get all your frustration out right here, right now, go ahead. The comment section is yours for the taking. And you can also treat those frustrations at Roundtable Vids. And for my own thoughts on the episode, you can also find me at Ultra Fox. But again, I'll be going more in depth at another video. And we're also on Instagram. Don't worry, guys, I'll make a post just for your venting frustrations. Probably before this video even goes up. You can help the Roundtable grow by either becoming a member of the channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link to everything in the description. If you enjoy this video, please sort of like and subscribe to the round table so we can do more star breakdowns. Help us grow. Help us do more. We're so excited for the future. Thank you for watching and I hope you have an awesome day. Oshark Fox, out.